in the studio with me, Neil McCabe, conservative columnist at townhall.com and editor of the Washington Mercury News site, washingtonmercury.com. And that's a new gig. You, know, you did that. This, this is like the last time you were here. You just started that. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. And uh, it's a great little site, and we hope to do some uh, amazing things with it. Cool. So uh, the president is going to give a State of the Union address tonight. And uh, part of this is about dealing with basically poverty in the United States. I mean, we, we've got half of all school children in the United States living below the poverty level. Yes. This is not a good thing. It's a terrible thing, and probably we should kickstart that economy and maybe uh, pull some people out of uh, poverty, as we saw in India and China, where uh, liberal economic policies... Liberal uh, as, as in... Uh, Gladstone. <laughs> deregulated, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I would, I would argue strongly that, that we would not see... that China would not be the way it is, and, and India, for that matter. Uh, although India took a slightly different path, more, more electronic more customer service because they speak English. I mean, sure. That was, that was Jack Welch's uh, epiphany in 82, I think it was. Yeah. Um, but that basically that wouldn't have happened without our insane trade policy. But it, here's just some, some things that I, I think the president is trying to address in his State of the Union address tonight. Um, since 1980, the income of the bottom 90% of Americans has increased $303. This is since Reagan became president, 1%. Sure. The top 1%'s income has more than doubled, increasing by about $500,000. But the top one-tenth of 1% has quadrupled their income to $22 million. They used to make around $5 million. Well, I mean, the wealthy... And their, and their taxes have gone down. The Mitt Romney loophole is just hugely, extensively used by people with incomes over a million dollars. Well, the wealthy have done very well on, under Obama, and I think that's why they they support him and his policies. Well, I'm, I'm saying since I mean, 1980. But I think one of the things that uh, you have to remember, Tom, is that, yes, the one you talk about the 1%, but the people in the 1% isn't always the same. So if you go to sort of these Forbes lists of the richest people in America, well, the Forbes list is not the 1%. That's the one one hundredth of 1%. But still, or there's the one, movement one there. One ten-thousandth of 1%. And, and, and certainly there are family fortunes that dissipate, and then there are new wealthy that come up. I yeah, mean, but that has nothing to do with this. this you know, meanwhile, a full-time worker's wage was 11% lower in 2004 than in 1973, even though their productivity increased 78%. I mean, well, Reaganomics I mean, has flipped our economy on its head. It used to be that as our economy grew and and companies did better, companies sure. were more profitable, that workers saw... I mean, I remember the 80s. I mean, I lived through the 80s. I worked in the 80s. Me too. The 80s were great for me personally, and oh, they were great for everyone I the knew. The 80s were fine. It takes it takes a decade or two for you know, large even, macroeconomic things you like know, huge even tax though, cuts. To, even though things stalled out under George H.W. Bush in the first term of Clinton, as soon as uh, Newt Gingrich came in, Gingrich and Clinton got together, <laughs> and then you had another boom in 95. You know, none of that has, has to do with personalities. You know, you know that this, th these, <laughs> these, these have to do with things like the, the Arabs decide to boycott oil or the internet sure. ro gets rolled out. Sure. And there are or, sunspots or, or somebody, <laughs> no, you know, so the, you know, somebody develops the moves from the transistor to the integrated but, circuit. But certainly the, if, if the, if the president was concerned about helping the poor, he would know that the poor don't want handouts. The poor want opportunities and they want jobs. And they want the opportunity to start their own businesses, and they want the and then those people who start new businesses want to hire other people, and then they. Well, I think as a starting point, the poor would would like to stop paying more taxes than the rich. Um, this from the New York Times today, Charles Blow's column in 2015: the poorest fifth of Americans will pay on average 10.9 percent of their income in state and local taxes. The middle fifth pay nine percent. Yeah. The top one percent average five percent. Well, so so the top one percent pay. A little less than half as much in state and local taxes as the bottom twenty percent of Americans. But, and, but that's and not amount, though. So. I mean, like just talking to the federal government, the top one percent pay what thirty to forty percent of the revenues. It's what? between thirty-two and thirty-six percent for federal taxes. But, okay, so but that's a very, that's so a, that, that 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 number is part of the Rush Limbaugh big lie. I mean, that that number. No, is, it's true. It's well, it, it is in that in that. Uh, and, and first of all, I think the numbers are a few years old. It, it's it's, oh, probably, it's probably, probably gotten worse. Who knows? But but it doesn't count the fact that, A, the rich are making more than anybody else. So yes. they, they've got more, so they should be paying more taxes. B, 
most of the truly rich, I mean, that, that, those statistics apply to the top 1% or maybe the top 5% or whatever. I mean, they, they carefully choose the slice they want. If you really want to talk about, to be in the 1% in the United States, you have to make $300,000 a year. That's, that's your brain surgeons, your, mm-hmm. your rocket scientists. That is not the rich. I'm sorry. That's the high end of the upper middle class. Sure. You don't see somebody with $300,000 a year income having a 25-bedroom mansion. Well, out, I'll tell you, you know. this. I, I, I would say that that's, that's basically the Dick Van Dyke show. That's Rob Petrie and his neighborhood. Well, yeah, you or, or a lawyers, step above. You know, you, know, you got TV Rob, writers. In, and, in, today's, in today's dollars, Rob Petrie was probably making $150 a year. But, okay. but, but you know, in that neighborhood. Sure. My, that My point is that the that that talking about the 1%, the way that Limbaugh and everybody else does, and how much they pay in taxes, is so disingenuous. It's such a lie, because A, yeah, people making $300,000 a year working with their bodies or their brains, brain surgeons, actually pay a 39% income tax rate. But people making $5 million a year, or a billion a year, like John Paulson, who made $5 billion in 2010 and paid nothing in income taxes. Well, when, when you hit those high levels of income in the top one hundredth of 1%, you're looking at people who are making most of their money in capital gains. The top capital gains rate right now is 23%. Well, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of money salted away in family trusts and foundations. No, I mean, I'm talking so about like, income, not wealth. I'm, but you see, I think you know one of the things is that if you want to talk about wealth, you've got 80 people but, in the world who own more wealth than the than 50 percent of the planet. 80 people. Sure. And so, but you know, this is lot, wrong. But one how of the can problems, you justify that? But one of the problems with taxing income is that's new people on the way up. You know, whereas they're so that new new money is being taxed as it's being made. And then, of course, you have what the president's going to do tonight is going to propose a new way to tax uh, estates. Yeah, which here, is this this from the which uh, I, I know you adore from today's Financial Times. The Congressional Budget Office estimated in 2013 that 93 percent of the benefits from the pref- pre- preferential tra- tax treatment of capital gains. That's how really rich people earn their money. And it doesn't show up in that 36 percent statistic that Limbaugh and everybody on the right quotes because they're only quoting payroll. Right. They're not quoting capital gains. The CBO estimates in 2013 that 93% of the benefits from the preferential tax treatment of capital gains flowed to the richest 20% of Americans, and a full 68% of the benefits went to the top 1%. And and then they say, you know, money raised from the changes in the way capital gains are taxed would would be funneled into initiatives to ease the tax burden on the middle class, provide a new credit for families where both spouses work, for example, and expand the incentives for child care. What's wrong with that why well, should I, why should Mitt Romney not pay the exact same income tax rate that the guy who who uh, you know cuts his hair does well I, I think capital gains has to be a separate category but I think no it's not of, a separate category because it's how most rich people take their money but if you're saying if you're just going to tax money as money then drop the capital gains rate and then drop and then drop no, everybody. Tax income drop as everybody. income capital gains is income just like labor is well, we like capital. We we do want people to invest. No, we, I, 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 if people are going to invest, whether capital gains, you know, Reagan actually is the saint of this. And in, in 1986, he equalized them. Capital yeah, and gains I, and, and, thought, and ordinary and income were the amazing. exact same rate. Would you take the 86 deal again? No, because it was 28 percent. It was stupid. But at least he got capital <laughs> gains from 20 percent up to 28 percent while he took ordinary income from 74 percent down but, to 28 But the other amazing thing that he did, Tom is that by getting rid of all of, by flattening things out... He destroyed the American middle class. Well, he also he also put lobbyists out of business, and all the people who sell... That's, that's why there's not the reason why, 35... You know, there were only 800 registered lobbyists no, but, in this town when Reagan came into town. There's 34,000 Well, the now. reason why you want tax rate to be high is because nobody really pays those high rates, and then you can sell no, the people, rates. No, people actually... Because, people no, actually because there's did. deferred... Comp- even in the 50s, there was deferred compensation... Hang on, and, hang on just a second. Uh, uh, this is the Tom Hartman program. Neil McCabe is with us. You can stick around? Absolutely, sure. Okay. Washington the Washington Mercury.com. We'll be right back. So feel free, ask. No, me. let me just ask you, Tom. <laughs> when you're talking about it. those numbers, um, how much of that number uh, for the regressiveness of the taxes is because of the payroll taxes and the Social Security and the Medicaid and that stuff? You know, because I think everyone is really thrilled when they get their first job at McDonald's or the supermarket or summer camp. I know I was when I thought 
you know, at, at Boy Scout camp, I thought I had earned $50 for eight weeks, and I found out that, you know, I actually got thirty a check for $33 at the right. end of my eight weeks. Well, and this is, this is, you know, Charles Blow has a great piece in today's New York Times about this, Neil, uh, called How Expensive It Is to Be Poor. And, and he points out that, you know, poor people are paying taxes. Here's, here's the piece, if you're interested. Sure. Um, but poor people are paying taxes on the first dollar they earn. And, you know, rich people are not. Well, well, so they, gasoline, they, they, and how about sales tax? Yeah. I mean, I mean all, how many people? All of these things are regressive. They're hits on, but here's, this is, this is Les Leopold has this piece in uh, Alternate today. This is the one I thought I'd print it out, but apparently I didn't. But he says, uh, during World War II, all income over 2.6 million in today's dollars was taxed at a 94% rate. Uh, he says, think about that for a minute. Basically, this rate served as a cap on elite compensation. After banksters hit 2.6 million, they received only six cents on the dollar. In 1956, during the conservative Eisenhower administration, it was still that that tax rate was 91% of all income over 3.4 million. So they raised the threshold from 2.6 to 3.4 million. In 76, 70 cents of every dollar of income over 807,000 went to federal income tax. And the net effect of this was that the CEO lived next door to the people that they worked with. He might have had a nicer house, but he didn't have, you know, it, it wasn't like... Listen, I, I've, we've had this conversation before. The CEOs were not living in that neighborhood. Well, maybe not, of, a, maybe, like, maybe not of the thousand largest corporations in America, but there used to be... Th every town in America used to have hundreds of small businesses. They don't sure. anymore. Now, now you've got you know, all these chain businesses, and you've got basically employees. So there's no CEOs in most well, towns. Well, it's almost, I don't know, it's like the corn, the corn laws or forced collectivization, but there has been a sort of wiping out of this sort of yeoman uh, businessman, even with dry, dry cleaning, they're rolling up the dry cleaners. It, it started in 1982 bakery. when Reagan said, we're not going to enforce the Sherman Act anymore. Well, I we're, don't going, know we're going to allow unlimited. No, it, come on, Neil. You lived through the '90s. Yes. We are going to allow virtually unlimited mergers and acquisitions. And what happened? Well, Michael Milken and a whole bunch of people came out, and they even invented a new category: M and A artists. Remember the M and A artists? Remember mergers and acquisitions? Well, yeah, guys? but you can but you can put things together and you can break them apart, and you get a commission on each side. But for which instance, is what they were doing. But but what you're doing in the process station. is putting small businesses. But out look of at like just take, take like gas stations. It was the policy of the Clinton administration to wipe out the small independent gas stations because it was oh, easier on. because it was easier to enforce the environmental laws when these things are run by corporations or they were larger no, and that was they, just a set policy they, you you can't say that that i mean nobody in the clinton administration ever said yes. let's wipe out small gas stations i didn't say wipe out but they yeah, said that's it was what you just said. it was their pol in effect what their policy was they did not want the small independent gas station and where are the small independent no, gas the, stations? The they're gone. Well, I, I think that they're gone because the because the gas companies, uh, the companies that are selling it's, gasoline, have said, "Hey, you know, if we, have, also if we have smaller outlets, they're and used they, to see." No, no, this goes back to Reagan again. Before 1982, you had four gas stations on every corner because they were competing. You had you had a dozen American oil companies. I now mean, you've got how two. How can you say there, there was nothing in the 80s or under Reagan that was against competition? Yes, there were absolutely the competition was. was booming. The Sherman Act. There were new businesses all the time. The Sherman Act is what protected competition. It's prevented monopoly. The competition protects competition. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Tom Hartman. Here with you, Neil McCabe, in the studio with us. Where did I, I put? I'm, I've, I've been moving my papers around, so I don't have your. Here it is, right here. I'm just, uh, I, I'm just going to start weeping at the fate of all of these trees. <laughs> How many trees do you think were felled? How many homeless owls? Are every day because of the you're Tom talk, Hartman show. You're talking about all the paper on my desk. <laughs> what, what, what we need, what this proves, Neil, is that we need to legalize hemp. You know. <laughs> Because if this stuff was grown out of hemp, it would be no big deal. I mean, it just like, you know, the, the first draft of the Declaration of Independence, right? It was, We're all it was it, it written on hemp for our paper. Navy. There you go. Rope for the Navy. So, so anyhow, what, we, what, what we're talking about here. Oh, we're talking about how Obama is crushing the people 
with taxes and regulation. Let me, and tonight let me, it's going to be more of the same. Yeah, okay. That's, you know, I, you, we both read the Republican talking points. And, <laughs> and, 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 and uh, by the way, how much do you want to bet that Jody Ernest, uh, Joni Ernst does not mention the fact that her family took over $400,000 in farm price supports? In other words, welfare for farmers. I'm more concerned that if she really is a colonel in the uh, National Guard, she should probably get that haircut in standard. Yeah. Because her hair is way out of control for a colonel. Well, what can you say? Um, I'm also wondering if she's going to castrate a member of the Senate tonight. <laughs> we'll see. Well, I think okay. it's, uh, the speaker's already been the, castrated. The, so. um, the Progressive Change uh, Institute, PCI, has conducted Great bunch their, of kids. their Big Ideas Project after <laughs> one million votes were cast by the public yeah. on 2,600 ideas. And <laughs> so I just wanted to share these with you. Sure. You know, this is... Uh, uh, by the way, these have been reviewed by Eliminated uh, Harry Reed, Wilf. Warren, Tester, Schumer, Franken, bloody, bloody, blah. Okay, here we go. Number one, now is the time to expand Social Security, not cut it. We're facing a retirement crisis where seniors can't rely on pensions and other pi- parts of the social contract. Wow. How yeah. about creating more workers? What are, what are the workers now? One and a half for every retire? What's no, it? it's not even close. It's, it's, it's like it's in the neighborhood of five or six to one. Okay, I mean, it, yeah, was, it was it was twenty was, to one in 1935. So let's go back but, to that instead of basically it's kind of a Ponzi scheme. Well, no, what we did was we we doubled the taxation on the Boomer generation in 1982 as a result of Reagan's reform of Social Security. He doubled His bipartisan reform. Yeah, no, no, sure, sure. I, I, sure. It was it was Tip O'Neill. I mean, you know, who, yeah, who put the but, thing together along with Alan Grace, uh, Greenspan. But but you know, the Boomers are the only generation in the history of Social Security to not only pay for the retirement of their parents but also set aside a savings account for their own retirement. So it's not a Ponzi scheme. There's two point seven trillion dollars sitting in that account, which Pete Peterson can't wait to get his hands. Well, we on. should unlock that and allow people to take control of their own Social Security, like uh, David Cameron's trying to do in England. And yeah. apparently, Obama thinks Cameron's the greatest. Yeah, that works. That works so well for all those people who had five hundred one k's in two two thousand eight, right? And they were just starting to retire, just as their five hundred one k drop or four hundred one k dropped, now, dropped in half. Where's the market now, Tom? half. Where's the market now? Yeah, well, if you're retiring <laughs> this week, but that's the point. You know, if you, you your yes. retirement is not, you know, it's Go, next it's point. Not a good I'm sorry. Okay, number two, corporations are paper, not people. Well, I mean, who owns them? It's people. People right. own them. Right. So you regulate the behavior of the corporation, but you give the freedom of speech to the people. I would like to see the Justice Department start going after people, frankly. Yeah, okay. I mean, we can agree on that. Number three, tax equality. It means that 100% of everyone's income is taxed for Social Security, not just working class people. This is what you were this talking the, about the, when you earned the, the, earned the 50 bucks that Well, there's year. two sides of it, because first, you get whacked when you, you know, percentage-wise with your first job. But also, you max out. So there are very wealthy people throughout the year. They hit that, that max. About 118000 yeah. And after that, they pay nothing. So aren't you a fan of flat taxes? I'm huge on the flat tax, Tom. Then why not flat tax Social Security? Why shouldn't Bill Gates pay the exact same percentage that I pay, or you pay, or anybody else pays? Uh, I'm, I'm actually very sympathetic to that. I think okay, I, all I, right. I, so you're, you're with the progressive change group. If only, if only because it makes the wealthiest, most powerful people in America angry, and then we can maybe end Social Security. <laughs> okay, all right. So I, I get your I get your logic. All right, decentralize the number four. Decentralize the funding of political campaign through matching funds, democracy vouchers so that, to every voter. <laughs> so the Congress vouchers. depends on all of us and not just on the tiny 1% who now effectively fund their campaigns. How about getting the government out of uh, running the government? The, go- the government should not be deciding what? who the government is. What? I don't... What the government has no business regulating elections. Uh, regulating like this campaign finance and everything like that, and the government shouldn't be but, subsidizing but, campaigns. But, but you think a handful of billionaires do have that business? Well, work for Eugene McCarthy. What? What does that work for to Jack do with Kennedy? That? I mean, there were wealthy people of finance campaigns in the past. If you make an argument and you win, then who cares how you got your money? Well, it depends on what the argument is, because how disingenuous people... it is. And by the way, advertising does work. There's a reason why why Procter and Gamble spends a billion dollars sure, a year in advertising. But... They want to sell more Prell. You know, it works. And when you sell a candidate, if you, if you've got a bigger ad budget, you're going to sell that but candidate. But over and over again, we have the examples of an Eric Cantor or President Phil Graham. Those, those are the outliers, and you know that. You know, but they exist. It happened. Right. It's not like I made right. it so, up. It so did happen. So you think that we should continue with a system where wealthy people fund campaigns and and then I mean that's it, the way it always has been. Didn't, no, it's not. It's actually not. And 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 you know I mean the I mean Supreme our first Court presidents has, were very wealthy men. Our first congressmen, I mean, very wealthy men. Thomas run. Jefferson died in bankruptcy. So did George Washington. 
he lived a very rich life. He borrowed a ton of money. He lived because well, of the, but he, because, you know, know, because of the value was, of his... He was a country squire compared to the genuinely the, uh, wealthy. But, but you and I both know that at the eve of the revolution, he was like but one we, of the wealthiest we, okay, men in have, America. He, yeah, no, he was not. Actually, he was. The wealthiest man in America. Carol? The, the, no, the, the wealthiest man who signed the declaration was John Hancock. And his net worth, his total net worth at that time in today's dollars was $700,000. These guys were the upper middle class of their day. Well, but, all right, he was a smuggler. Go ahead. Okay. All right. <laughs> and the oil, oil depletion allowance. Stop subsidizing the oil industry. Uh, I'm, I'm very nervous about uh, what's being called subsidies for the uh, oil industry. It has, has, mar it's has margins of, the... it's running margins of uh, what, 9 or 10%. Um, you take deductions, you, know, you pay taxes on income. And there diff each industry has different rules to figure well, out what's at, income at and not income. At least let's do what Alaska does and tax that oil when it comes out of the ground because it belongs to the state. And then and, then do, <laughs> and do like Sarah the people and do like Sarah Palin did. I mean, her family got forty thousand dollars from the state of Alaska permanent fund the year that she was running for vice president. I think that uh, Alaska is a unique situation. Oh, so you don't want socialism for Alaska is fine, but not for everybody else. I was actually up in Anchorage, and I was interviewing the newly elected Republican mayor. Oh. And I said, I said, what do you think about this uh, permanent fund? He says, it's great. And I said, so a little socialism is fine. He goes, yeah. The next day, the headline in the Anchorage paper, mayor says I like socialism. He was totally The humiliated. red mayor of Anchorage? Yeah, right. <laughs> Neil McCabe, TheWashingtonMercury.com. You're great listening to, to the Tom Hartman just, program. Right. Call 202-536-2370. Townhall.com, TheWashingtonMercury.com. Neil, thanks for being here today. So great to see you, as always. Enjoy the speech tonight. Thank you.